Our scripture today comes from Mark 4, verses 30 through 32, and I'll be reading from the New International Version. The parable of the mustard seed. Again he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. Good morning, church. <laughs> Just so excited to be here with you today. And those online, hello to you as well as we continue into our sermon series. Okay, you didn't, no, 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 it's not good enough. I need, I need more today. I, into our sermon series. There we go. All right, there we go. You're, you're, you're awake and you're alive and you're here. That's great. As we uh, continue to worship the Lord and, and study the parables of Jesus. And just a reminder, as the parables of Jesus, not only are we talking about them up here, but we're also discussing them down in our children's churches and uh, that way, whenever you get together with the family, whether you know, it's a grandkid or maybe your own kid or maybe you picked a kid up off the street and brought him to church today, you can have a conversation with them after service and, uh, and have some good uh, fellowship there as you discuss. Let us pray together. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, as we're here today, uh, it does occur to me that last week, not only did we have a, a twofer here in our song, but we're going to get a twofer here in parables. It's a special day. You didn't know you were just going to be doubly blessed all along. But I uh, wanted to go back because our children last week did uh, get to study a little bit of a different parable than what we had here today. So I want to go back and just touch base on it. And that way, uh, if you have a conversation with your kids, you can have some more there. But there's another parable as Jesus is talking through different stories and parables, especially about the kingdom of God. When he's describing what is the kingdom of God like, he starts comparing it all sorts of things but he especially is comparing them to like plant life and especially crops and garden things and all sorts of stuff when he's describing the kingdom of God and so he tells a story before we get to our story today he tells another story in Matthew chapter 13 that we commonly call the wheat and the weeds or the wheat and the tares or if you want the official Greek word for it it would be the wheat and the zizania and it's quite an interesting story, right? And the story basically goes like this. Jesus says, okay, the kingdom of God is like this. It's like a sower goes out, sows good seeds. Everything's great. Middle of the night, his enemy comes and sows bad seeds, specifically this Zinzania seeds. And we'll get to that in a minute. But sows the seeds, and all of a sudden, the servants come in one day to the master, and they say, master, did you not plant good seeds? Why then there is there all this bad stuff growing? And with the good stuff, do you want us to rip it out and to to get out all the bad stuff. And the master says, no, no, no. My enemy has done this, but don't rip it out because if you do, it's going to rip out the good as well as the bad. Let them grow together. And at the end of this, once they've all fully grown, we're going to harvest them and we'll separate the good from the bad and the bad we will bundle up and burn and the good we will, of course, bring it into our storehouses and celebrate. And it's an interesting story because as you hear it, this, what's, what's kind of crazy about it is you think, who would do such a thing? Who would go into their you know, fellow neighbor's yard or, or whatever and sow bad seed? And specifically, the seed that they're talking about is a ryegrass, and uh, we call it kind of darnel maybe or something like that. There's different names for it. But what's crazy about it is that it's poisonous. It's seeds. And you don't want to eat it, right? It's actually a really, really bad plant, but it mistakenly looks exactly like the seeds of wheat when they're growing beginning, but yet when they fully get fully bloomed, you can tell a huge difference in them. And so you don't know until it's way too late that these bad seeds are growing. There's, by that time, they're all intertwined in their root systems and all these things, and you can't. You can't pull them out without ripping all of them up. Now, the crazy thing about this is it actually seems like it was somewhat common in the ancient days to do this to your enemy. <laughs> in fact, we got writings that are left over from things where people, I guess, passive aggressively, you know, if you're really aggressive, you just burn their house down or whatever. But if you wanted to be passive or aggressive about it, you would do this type of thing. And then you'd write notes to other people about how, what you did. And these, some of these have survived. And we have 
notes about people doing this very thing to other people's gardens, other people's, you know, plows, or not plows, but the fields and things like that. And in fact, there was a Roman law that we come across that actually said specifically, don't do this. You're not supposed to plant bad seed in somebody else's yard. No, 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 don't do that. And actually they had a law about it. And I don't think it was, when you look at these other sources, you don't think in Jesus' teachings, you don't get the idea that this was something that was just out of the blue, but something at least somewhat common that people had actually experienced. Now what's crazy about this is that you think about this sermon, what is it teaching about what it means for the kingdom of God? And if the first kingdom parable that we looked at was the idea that that not only are there you know consequences to what is being uh, made, this one gives those consequences much bigger meaning. In other words, that first parable that we looked at, remember it was the good soil, it was the idea that, hey, if you receive the word, if the kingdom of God finds a place in your heart, it's going to grow and it's going to multiply and it's going to produce fruit abundantly in your life. And this one warns us that not only is that true, but there's also this other part of it, that there is consequences to this story and the kingdom of God coming into our life. And Jesus goes on and actually explains this in Matthew. If you read on, he actually explains and explains this to the disciples what this parable means and he describes that basically the seed the good seed are the believers and the bad seed are those who basically follow satan and the children of satan and in the end he gets to there and he says basically this is that the angels are going to come and reap a harvest one day and those who are of the devil are going to be thrown into a fiery furnace he says with weeping and gnashing of teeth quoting jesus and then the others are going to be shining like the sun the kingdom. You know, it's the teaching that says, hey, here and now God is patient with evil. But that day is coming to a close at some point. And evil is going to be dealt with. But it also teaches us that God is patient. That God doesn't want to uproot any of the good at all. And so he's going to be patient with evil to an extreme extent. And in that patience, is there because he doesn't want to lose any one of those that are precious. And it is one of the answers to the problem of evil. You know, have you ever thought about that? Like, why does evil exist in the world? Well, part of the reason why it exists in the world is because if God came and stamped it all out in that stamping, it would naturally undo some of the good seed that's there. Now, at the end of the parables, Jesus always says one of those things, you know, he who has ears, let them hear. And when Jesus says that, he, it's your cue to know, hey, you can do something about this, right? So one of the key things to understand in this parable is you're not set in stone one or the other seed, right? In the sense that, like, when you you go through life, you have the option to be either one. Are you going to be the good seed or the bad seed? And Jesus Christ is challenging us that the kingdom of God does this separation of these two things and reminds us. Well, that was that story there. So sermon number one is over. Sermon number two, you get two for today. Woo! And so two, sermon number two is the exact message that we just heard, the Gospel of Mark in chapter 4, verse 30. It's about a mustard seed. Now, when I was in youth group, I remember this, that uh, we got, our youth leader got us like a little kind of glass necklace, and in it was a little itty, bitty, 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 tiny mustard seed, right? And it was this little tiny thing, and of course you had to put it in something else because if it wasn't in something else, it would just, you would never be able to hold on to it because it was tiny little itty bitty bitty thing and the whole message was this when you study this parable of Jesus was what is the kingdom of God like the kingdom of God is going to start small and grow into something really big and in fact in those days uh, we, we kind of understand this idea that the mustard seed they're talking about is what we call the black mustard seed of kind of African and, and, and uh, that part of the world and so it's interesting about this because as the seed is there it is truly a very small seed now, Jesus lived in Jerusalem and also Israel at the time. And what's interesting about this is when he says that it becomes the largest and the biggest of things, it's interesting that he chooses the mustard seed. Because he ch- could have chose something like the cedars of Lebanon, <laughs> which grow under these huge, vast, tall trees. In fact, we know everybody in Israel is, is, knows these trees by heart because it tells in the scripture, King David built not only the, his palace out of the cedars of Lebanon, but he built the temple to the God Most High out of the cedars of Lebanon. This is something that everybody knew. They, they knew about trees that were grand and huge and large. And yet Jesus, instead of picking one of them, he chose the mustard tree 
which if you get into like strict classification, it's not even a tree, really. It's like a shrub <laughs> that becomes like a tree, right? It's actually kind of these interesting plants, very unusual plant in many different ways. And yet Jesus, when he's talking about the kingdom, chose it over a bunch of other things he could have chose. It's so interesting to me when you read about this story. You know, Jesus it was a Mediterranean man as well as the Son of God. And so when he's there, he, of course, talks like a Mediterranean man. Now, one of the big important things you need to know about that is they don't talk in superlatives like you and I do. So when I say it's the tallest mountain, there's only one mountain that comes to your mind, right? If, if you're from kind of you know, the North America or Western European descended or even just how our society thinks about that, you think of Mount Everest, right? That's what you're thinking in your head. That's not what other people in other parts of the world think of. They use superlatives in a much more loosey way than we do. And what I mean by that is they will say things like, it is the tallest, hugest thing in the world, but it's not. And everybody knows that. But they're using hyperbole to make a point in their story. And so when Jesus specifically says, hey, the mustard seed is the smallest of seeds, he's using the hyperbole that Middle Eastern people do, especially even today, but even especially back then, that he have hyperbole of making a point. Because, of course, you can go into any scientific book and find smaller seeds that exist in the world. But his point was not that this is the smallest seed. He was using it as a reference point of what the kingdom of God is like. And so he uses hyperbole in these moments, and we should understand that. But what's interesting is that if you look at the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, at least, record the story. And they all tell it slightly different. And it's one of those things that as I grew up, you know, I, I didn't grow up in a farmland, per se, or work on the, on the farm, per se. So these are things that just I would totally miss, but maybe you caught this if you've ever been reading through, if you grew up on a farm or things like that, is they record where the seed is planted differently in this parable. That's really interesting, and it will become a point here. But, for instance, in Matthew, the seed is sown in a field. In other words, where the wheat is, right? And the other harvest crops. In Mark, it just simply says the earth. And in Luke, it specifically says the garden, which the garden is not the same thing as a field. As we know today, it's true, but even back then, is also true. There are different things. You grow different plants and stuff in them. Now, what's unusual about that is when you look at Mark and Matthew, the understanding of the rabbinic sources that we have tell us about Israelite in the way that they grew different plants. They got very specific of what could grow where, and they told that these type of trees, these mustard trees that Jesus is talking about that grow big and grow basically leaves and branches and all this stuff, all of those get grown in a field, not a garden. And so when Jesus is teaching it, one of the easy things to miss is he says at first, it's planted. When he gets to the end, he doesn't talk about the field. He talks about it's the tallest of the garden plants. In other words, what started in the field didn't stay there. It was so invasive, if you will. It was so multiplying, if you will. It was so hard to weed out and get out that it actually went into the garden and grew up there. And so not only is it this small thing that starts very small, that grows into something big, it is something that's nigh unstoppable. That when it grows and grows into this big thing, the kingdom of God is not only going to be small and then turn into something big, but that it's also a place where it invades other things. And it doesn't know its own boundaries, if you will. And it can't be marked off and said, come here and no further. The kingdom of God goes, nope, stepping over that stone wall and going into the garden, if you will. And so the very thing that not only is this the big piece of the, the small thing that becomes big and bigger than all the other garden uh, uh, plants not only does it grow up and provide shelter for any of the birds that would come and perch and find a home and even make a nest there, but there's also an element that the early understanders and the hearers of the gospel had heard that maybe we don't hear today, but it was obnoxious to anybody who opposed it because it was going to come into their garden and make some changes, whether you liked it or not. And for those that try to root it out and try to take care of it, going to be a thorn in their side, so to speak. Now, it's interesting. I um, live in the Parsonage, which lives over by Founders Bend area. And if you don't know that neighborhood, it's kind of like if you go out just College Street and you go towards, uh, you know, 317. And when you get up there, there's the soccer fields on one side. On the other side is a couple ponds. 
they're not huge ponds, but they're big enough to track every goose in Ohio. I don't know what, you know what I'm saying? Like, and, 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 and it got to the point of just being ridiculous. And I'm sure any of you have driven out there, you know, in the past, you know, number of years, there's been, if you go out in the morning or the evening or just any time of the day, there's just hundreds of geese walking through the streets. And they're nesting in everybody's neighbor and everybody's house and in every garden. And then, of course, they're attacking you and your dogs. And I mean, like these things are aggressive and they're territorial and they don't like people very much. And they're not scared of cars at all. And so my neighborhood had just, you know, fits about this. And so we tried everything under the sun. And so we had, uh, you know, we started off with like these streamers, like the tinfoil streamers. We put them all in the trees, you know, and all that stuff. And the geese went, meh, it's fine, right? And then we tried all sorts of different things. I think the city actually got out and got like a fake uh, coyote and stuck it in. And then everybody called the city saying, hey, there's a coyote. You need to come get it. And so they put a sign next to it that said, hey, fake coyote. Don't do this, right? And that worked to some degree. But basically, the geese stopped going to that one section and went over to the other pond and then over to the soccer fields. And they would just kind of go around it. Well, eventually, people in my neighborhood uh, you know, bought a bunch of them. So we have like, if you come into Founders Bend, it's now Coyoteville, if you know what I'm saying. Like, you come in and it's funny because the wind blows them over all the time. So there's these bungee cords that they put over it to stake it into the ground. So you got just, it's a silly, it looks like the silliest thing ever, but it actually somewhat works. And I say somewhat because you got all these like fake plastic coyotes, right? And then you got, you know, all this stuff going on. And, and we got swans, like fake swans that ended up in the pond. But of course, like every now and then they tip over and they're upside down and they don't look like fake swan at all. They just look weird. Uh, so all this funny stuff happens. And the geese were scared of these things. Eventually it did work. The geese kind of left. Uh, not so fast. Because something small has started. And if you come to our neighborhood, there is a family of geese with little goslings walking around. Now let me share this. They're walking around, but they're not just walking around. They're walking next to the coyote with the bungee cord on it. You know what I'm saying? They're swimming around the swan that's there, right? And what is starting really small is we all know what's coming in the next few years. All the geese are going to go, eh, we're not too scared of these things anymore, right? And our, our whole place is going to get flooded again. So I'll, I'll keep you tuned to what happens. But I guarantee if I was, I'm not a betting man, but if I was, I'd wager some money. We're going to have a goose problem once again in my neighborhood. But yet something small, and I just look at these, these little goslings that are just fluff balls, right? And I think of the vicious, horrendously horrible goose they're going to become one day. But yet they're so cute when they're little, right? And I realize in my head, something so small is going to turn into something so big, unstoppable. And my neighbors are, you know, like already kind of putting up fences and doing everything they can because they know at some point, you know, these, these are just going to, the whole family is going to be invited to their family reunion, you know what I'm saying? Like, and it's coming, but it's unstoppable. You can't do anything about it. And no matter how many coyotes you stick out, no how many swans you stick out, how many fences you put up, no how many smelly bad stuff you put out there, no matter what you do, the geese are going to win, right? And likewise, Jesus is saying, hey, the kingdom of God, it's like a mustard seed. It looks small. It's this tiny little thing. To use hyperbole, it's the smallest thing, smallest of seeds. And yet when you plant it, this tree, quote unquote, sometimes it translates, but it's really kind of like a shrub, grows into what looks like a tree, or can if it's a specific kind, and it can get up to nine feet tall, towering over everything in the garden, such that those that want to find refuge will flock to it. You see, not only are we learning, not only this idea that you and I are part of the kingdom in the sense that we have the option to be good soil and receive it. We have the option to be either the wheat or the tares. But we also have the option to make our home in the invasive kingdom that's coming. And the simple truth is, is that just like that kingdom, whenever we are faithful in small little things, God will it and make something huge out of it. Something, I dare say, invasive to the world that needs changed. I dare say, something that will radically alter someone else's story and someone else's life. And as always, Jesus closes this sermon with, he who has ears, let them hear.
Which soil are you? Are you the wheat or the tear? Is the invasive kingdom where you're going to make a home? Or are you going to try to uproot it? In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray this. Lord, may you come now in each of our lives. We open ourselves up to you and your kingdom and the teaching that is there. Continue to change us. And Lord, just like the geese that we know that are coming, may your kingdom come. May it just break down every wall that divides, every hurt that happens in this world, the violence that takes place. May your kingdom come. For those that are just lonely and those people that just struggle with life and feel outcast and and apart from others, may your kingdom come. For those that mourn and wonder if they can ever take another step in life, may your kingdom come even sometimes when we reject you and we pursue our own means and we want what we want when we want it and refuse to listen to you or the guidance you've given God even in those times may your kingdom come despite us Lord we love you we praise you and we follow you this day Amen